Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Real Talk, Real Solutions for Chronic Pain webinar. My name is Talisa King, and I am the facilitator for the African American Community Connect Group. I'm also someone who's been living with rheumatoid arthritis for the past 13 years, so I know how frustrating and how taxing that can be on your everyday life, not only physically, but mentally as well, emotionally too at times. So throughout the years, I've discovered all kinds of things to do that I can uh, use to help cope with living day to day with arthritis and different strategies to kind of get me through as best I can. And some of those things have really made a significant difference in my life. Some of them are proven treatments our experts will speak to and share tonight. So we will get started with some housekeeping rules. All attendees have been muted. The question and answer function at the bottom of the screen will help you when you want to type in questions. After the discussion, it'll be followed by Q&A. So you'll also receive an email asking you about your experience. And these surveys help the foundation better plan for future events. And so please take time to make sure that you fill them out. A recording of tonight's event will also be included in the post-event survey as well as available on the Arthritis Foundation's YouTube channel and webinar hubs. You can also register for upcoming webinars, which are hosted monthly on the webinars hub. Let's get started by introducing our guest. Our first guest will be Dr. Daniel Claw. Dr. Daniel Claw is a professor of anesthesiology, rheumatology, and psychiatry at the University of Michigan. He completed his residency and fellowships at Georgetown University, where he eventually held roles including Chief of Rheumatology and Vice Chair of Medicine. While at Georgetown, he assembled a team to study chronic pain disorders like fibromyalgia and low back pain. In 2002, he moved the group of investigators to the University of Michigan and founded the Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center, which he is now the director of. Until January 2009, he also served as the first Associate Dean for Clinical and Transitional Research within the University of Michigan Medical School and Principal Investigator of the School's Clinical and Transitional Sciences Award. Dr. Claw has helped change the landscape of how pain disorders are viewed and treated, including predicting how well chronic pain patients may respond to common therapies like surgery and opioids. Next, we will speak on Dr. Tamara Huff. Dr. Tamara Huff, better known as the Lady Bone Doc, graduated with honors from the university. She obtained her medical doctorate from the Medical College of Georgia and completed her orthopedic surgery residency at Ashner Clinic in New Orleans, Louisiana. In 2019, she founded Vigio Orthopedics, which was born out of her passion for increasing access to orthopedic care in underserved communities. Using her more than 15 years of medical and surgical experience in urban and rural areas, Dr. Huff and Vigio Orthopedics provides high quality evidence-based care and training to hospitals in need. Her fierce commitment to community outreach and education can also be seen through her many memberships. She is a board member of the Movement is Life Caucus, a coalition seeking to eliminate racial, ethnic, and gender disparities by promoting physical activity to improve overall health and quality of life. She is also a member of the Columbus, Georgia chapter of the Lynx Incorporated and the Columbus, Georgia alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. We'll start tonight's presentation by handing it off to Dr. Claw. Dr. Claw, take it away. Thanks so much, Talisa. Uh, can I have the first slide? Uh, this is a disclosure slide. You might see at the bottom that I've testified against opioid manufacturers in the state of Oklahoma, as well as in Florida. Um, and I really uh, hate the use of opioids to treat chronic pain. Uh, in the Q&A session, if People want to talk about opioids. We can talk about opioids, uh, but you'll uh, notice, at least in my talk, I'm really not going to talk about the use of opioids to treat chronic pain. Next slide. So what is pain? Well, <clears throat> at the end of the day, it's the body's way of telling you that something is wrong. And I think most people 
both uh, patients and doctors think that if you have a pain in an area of the body, that there's got to be something wrong in that area of the body. And certainly that's one of the reasons we have pain so that if we hurt ourselves so that we don't move that region of the body. But what we're learning is that a lot of chronic pain conditions where someone might have pain in one area of the body or another, there really is nothing wrong in that area of the body. And the pain is instead coming from the brain um, and the fact that the brain is too sensitive to pain. Um, and so I'm going to talk a lot about that at different types of mechanisms of pain because the different types of pain actually need different types of treatment. Next slide. So I'm clinically trained as a rheumatologist. These are two different individuals' knee x-rays. The one on the left is normal. The one on the right is advanced arthritis where there's bone rubbing against bone. It probably wouldn't surprise you if I told you that 10% of people with the x-ray on the left uh, have pain, even though the x-ray is entirely normal, that people have pain because there's things you wouldn't see on an x-ray that could cause pain. But what surprises almost everyone um, is that 30 or 40 percent of the people in the United States that have the x-ray like the one on the right don't have any pain. Even though they've lost all their cartilage and they have bone rubbing against bone, um, they really are not experiencing any pain. Um, and so I always start with this slide by showing that you can't see pain on an x-ray, that whether it's low back pain or arthritis or any type of pain, doing an x-ray or an MRI or a biopsy or an um, oscopy of the region of the body where you're experiencing pain, in many cases won't identify any problem that could be causing pain. And again, we've learned a lot about the type of pain uh, that I'm gonna be talking about today, uh, primarily in the last 10 or 20 years. Next slide. Um, and so uh, I'm old. When I was trained originally as a rheumatologist, I was actually trained that osteoarthritis, what I just showed that slide of, was the classic peripheral pain syndrome. And that if someone had the x-ray like the one on the right where they had bone rubbing against bone, that would always hurt. And if they had the one on the left, it would never hurt. But then studies in the 1990s in low back pain and in arthritis showed that there's a terrible relationship between what you see on an x-ray and whether someone has pain and how severe the pain is. And even a lot of the treatments that I was taught 30 or so years ago when I was trained worked really well, like opioids and um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and acetaminophen, which you might know as Tylenol. Um, even joint replacement surgery, uh, there's a lot of failures of all of those uh, treatments. And at least 20 or 30 percent of people who have joint replacement surgery don't have improvements in their pain, even though you're taking out a damaged joint and you're putting in a shiny new joint. Next slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about fibromyalgia, uh, not to talk about fibromyalgia as much as really talk about how our understanding of fibromyalgia has really helped our broader understanding of chronic pain conditions. Could you just advance one more? Uh, and so the original definition for fibromyalgia that was published in 1990, um, some of you might have been diagnosed in fibromyalgia in the old days where people pushed in certain areas and counted tender points. Um, but literally, the first definition of fibromyalgia was that someone had to have widespread pain, and they had to have um, 11 or greater out of 18 tender points. And tender points are these 18 areas of the body where you push, and if someone says it hurts, that's a tender point. Well, now, 30 years later, um, fibromyalgia has moved from being a condition that no one really knew what was causing it. A lot of people didn't think these people really had any problem. They thought they were just like crazy or making up their pain. Now, 30 years later, because of the advent of things like functional brain imaging, things that we in our group do a lot, um, fibromyalgia has become the poster child for the international pain researchers' third mechanism of pain. So for a long time, we've known about two mechanisms of pain. One mechanism is called nociceptive pain. When you have some sort of damage or inflammation, it's going to hurt. The second kind of pain is nerve pain or neuropathic pain. And most of you know about things like carpal tunnel syndrome or sciatica that are nerve pain. But the, the conditions like fibromyalgia are this third kind of pain that's now being called nosoplastic pain. And this might be the most common type of pain because conditions like headache, tension and migraine headache, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel, interstitial cystitis, um, all of those conditions now, even conditions like endometriosis, and low back pain are really thought that most people with those diagnoses have the same kind of pain that fibromyalgia patients have, 
rather than, um, again, everyone with endometriosis uh, having the pain just due to endometrial tissue in their pelvis. Next slide. And so one of the analogies that I started using 15 or so years ago, and it's still a really good analogy, if that's it's quite accurate, is that the amount of someone that pain that someone's experiencing is like the loudness of an electric guitar. And uh, in an electric guitar, there's two ways to make the noise louder. You can either turn up the um, amplifier or you can strum the strings harder. And the kind of pain that we see in conditions like fibromyalgia is really more of an amplifier problem, not a guitar problem, because um, any kind of pain that you're going to have in the human body, the, the nerves first signal that there might be something wrong out in the ear, out in the peripheral areas of the body. But in order for that to be felt as pain, it has to come through the spinal cord and upward to the brain to be felt as pain. And different people in the population are markedly different with respect to how pain sensitive they are, what their amplifier setting is. Women are a lot more pain sensitive than men. So women on average have a much higher amplifier setting. Women um, will feel more of what's on an x-ray than men. In fact, you see that x-ray on the right, I told you that 30 or 40% of the people in the United States that have that x-ray don't have any pain. Nearly all of those are men because men are, are, are literally inherently less pain sensitive. Um, and what we've learned is that this amplifier in the brain that, that different people have sort of different amplifier or volume control settings is not just your amplifier for how pain sensitive you are, but it is also the same part of the brain that tells you how bright a light is, how loud a noise is. So um, if you have had pain in a bunch of different regions of the body and you um, are bothered by the brightness of lights or the loudness of noises, I might be the first one to tell you that, that your pain isn't really coming in all likelihood from the areas of the body where you're experiencing pain, your, your pain is more likely to be coming because you have this increased amplifier setting um, and that any kind of sensory information um, in you is going to be interpreted as being sort of more unpleasant or higher intensity than someone else. Next slide. And so now we know there's three kinds of pain. No susceptive pain on the far left um, is, again, where the pain is due to inflammation or damage. This is the kind of pain that um, Dr. Huff can do amazing things with because she can do surgery and uh, do different types of interventions aimed at the area of the body where the person's experiencing the pain. And some of our drug and our non-drug therapies uh, really are going to work best in this kind of pain, like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or injections or surgery um, are really going to work best in this kind of pain. The, I'm not going to talk really much about nerve pain or neuropathic pain because it's not as common, but that's when there's either a damaged nerve or an entrapped nerve. But this third kind of pain uh, that fibromyalgia would be the poster child for, it would include headaches, um, bladder pain syndrome, interstitial cystitis, endometriosis. Um, and th the way we can tell that someone has this kind of pain, number one is their pain is much more widespread. It's not just in one area of the body or two areas of the body. And it's not just the pain is more widespread right now that you've had pain in different regions of the body at different points in time over the course of your life because the fundamental problem you had was the amplifier for pain processing in your brain was too high. But the other way that we can tell that someone has this kind of pain is they usually have other symptoms that are also coming from this dysfunction of the central nervous system. They have fatigue, they have sleep problems, memory and mood problems. So um, again, if you have had pain in multiple areas of your body, accompanied by fatigue, sleep, memory problems, um, and you happen to be more sensitive to the brightness of lights or the loudness of noises, um, if, I'm, if I'm the first one to tell you, um, your pain is really coming more so from the central nervous system. Um, and g getting, for example, surgery on your knee or an injection in your knee is not nearly as likely to help um, as certain types of drugs um, that are going to work more so by turning down the volume control in the brain. And a lot of non-drug therapies um, get, get more active, get sleeping better, um, diet. Um, Dr. Huff's going to talk a lot about those. N next slide. So all of these conditions, now this is another new word. You probably had ne have never heard the term nosoplastic pain. Another new word is chronic overlapping pain conditions. But if you have one of those conditions on the left, you, you may very well have had three or four of them over the course of your lifetime. And now what we know is that those are just really 
terms that were developed when, for example, low back pain, all it really means is you have pain in the back. It doesn't say anything about what's causing the pain. But all of these labels literally are now are just that the someone has pain in that area of the body. You can't find any damage or inflammation to account for the pain. And again, all of these conditions now were thought that nosoplastic pain, the same kind of brain pain that we see in fibromyalgia is really what's driving this. Now, we see that, that that also occurs in a lot of people that start by having no susceptive pain, but people with rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or any autoimmune disease, a third of them will develop this fibromyalgia-like pain um, as well. So even um, if you have a condition like rheumatoid arthritis as your primary pain condition or sickle cell disease as your primary pain condition, uh, a high proportion of those individuals, especially over time, develop the same kind of fibromyalgia-like pain. And the reason this is so important is that this kind of pain really requires a different kind of treatment. Next slide. And so I, we don't think of fibromyalgia as being yes or no. We think that different people have sort of different degrees of it. And all we're talking about here when we say that different people have different degrees of fibromyalgia um, is that different people have sort of different amplifier settings um, and all of us, when we're when we don't sleep very well, when we don't get enough um, activity or exercise, when we're under a lot of stress, these things will get worse. Our fibromyalgia will get a little bit worse, and so th these kind of fibromyalgia-like pain syndromes can be triggered by a lot of different things. They can be triggered by after you're in a motor vehicle accident, um, after you're deployed to war. Um, we even think that um, most of the people that have long COVID. Um, have something very similar to fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome, which is a, a, a close relative of fibromyalgia. Next slide. And so I'm just showing how something simple like a body map can be really helpful. Yeah, I showed you the body map um, earlier, but like imagine that someone comes in with knee pain. If they only have pain in a single site in their knee, there's likely to be a problem in their knee. But if they have a body map like this and they they really have pain all over, then uh, this is much more, this is a fibromyalgia patient. But again, some people will come into Dr. Huff with knee pain and say they want their knee replaced. Um, and I'll show you data right now that will show they won't go well. Um, because uh, again, if you have this body map, this is really indicating that much or, or all of your pain is coming from your brain and operating on the knee isn't necessarily going to be of any significant benefit. Next slide. And you can just keep going past to this slide, to the next slide. So uh, in studies that we've done where people got knee or hip replacement uh, surgery and we uh, looked at all sorts of variables like depression, anxiety, psychological factors, but the only thing additional that we looked at in these studies was we gave them the new measure for fibromyalgia on the day of surgery, thinking that again, this measure was really gonna tell us where someone was in this fibromyalgia continuum. And our hypothesis was that the higher people scored on the measure, the less well that surgery would work for their pain. And also that the less well that opioids would work for their pain because this kind of pain um, is really unresponsive to opioids. Uh, acute pain can be very well controlled with opioids, but this kind of sort of brain pain, fibromyalgia-like pain we really try to keep opioids away from these individuals because they often will make the pain worse instead of better. Next slide. Uh, um, and so again, uh, if you have pain, uh, what one thing you may wanna do is actually figure out what your score is on the fibromyalgia measure because this measure looks at a combination of how widespread your pain is, how many sites of pain you have, plus whether you have some of these symptoms like sleep problems, memory and fatigue, and you get a score, and literally the higher the score, um, the more likely your pain is coming from the central nervous system rather than the periphery. So this is the new fibromyalgia measure. We don't do tender point counts anymore. This is what we give people to diagnose fibromyalgia. You check how many places on that body map on the left you have pain. Uh, there's 19 sites on the body map. So if you had pain in all 19 sites, you'd get a score of 19. If you had seven sites, you'd get a score of seven. You come over to the right side, and then you say fatigue, memory problems, and sleep disturbance, and those are scored zero, one, two, or three, depending on whether they're absent, mild, moderate, or severe. And then you get one point each for the pain, depression, and headache that are sort of now hiding. There's a total of 31 points. But you see that by uh, having, and next slide, please, 
a combination of um, the just in when we did these surgery studies, the first surgery study we did was in knee and hip replacement surgery. The second one was in women getting um, a hysterectomy for chronic pelvic pain, but we found exactly the same findings in both of those studies that in both of the surgical studies, the higher the fibromyalgia score, each, each one point increase in the fibromyalgia score, people needed more um, opioids to control their pain. Each one point increase in the score made people less likely to get better if we uh, replaced their knee or their hip or if we did a hysterectomy. And these things were linear, like the higher your score, the less likely that a um, that something like surgery or opioids was going to help you. And there was nothing magical about the score of 13, which is the diagnosis of fibromyalgia, whether we say that either yes, someone has fibromyalgia or no, they don't. So we think that that people should think of having different degrees of fibromyalgia and use this fibromyalgia measure. And even if you don't quite meet criteria for fibromyalgia, if you score high on this because you have multifocal pain in several sites and you have in sleep and fatigue and memory problems, you really should be trying more of the treatments that we use for pain that's coming from the brain, the treatments for fibromyalgia, rather than the treatments that we um, would use for no susceptive pain. Next slide. So this is just from that some of the studies that we did. Um, why don't you advance the slide all the way? It just compares two different patients that were getting knee replacement surgery. Um, patient A um, just has pain in his knee and a little bit of fatigue. He had a fibromyalgia score of two. Patient B has pain in his knee plus pain in several other sites, plus some sleep and some fatigue, and he had a fibromyalgia score of 11. And look at how different those two people are. Even though patient B didn't have fibromyalgia, he would have had to have a, a score of 13 where the red line is in order to have fibromyalgia. Um, just because he had higher fibromyalgia in this, um, the, the, that individual was far less likely to get better um, when his knee was replaced and needed a lot more opioids to control his pain in the in acute post-operative period. Next slide. And so advance one more, please. Now what we know is that we used to think that like osteoarthritis you see down in the bottom left panel, we used to think that all pain in osteoarthritis was no susceptive, all pain in diabetic painful neuropathy was neuropathic, and all pain in fibromyalgia was coming from the central nervous system. But now it gets more complicated because we know a lot of people with fibromyalgia have some osteoarthritis, and they, which would mean they would have some pain mechanisms on the left. And we know that a lot of people with osteoarthritis or autoimmune disorders, again, I said about a third of those people um, even though their primary condition is osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, they have um, comorbid, or in addition to that, this kind of pain, this fibromyalgia-like pain. And you have to treat both kinds of pain. If you have um, both uh, nociceptive pain and this centrally driven brain pain, they, you need different treatments. They need different types of approaches. Next slide. Um, and so we do a lot of work looking at brain imaging and things like that to really see why people have these pain conditions, even though there's nothing identifiably wrong in the areas of the brain. Next slide. Um, but you see sizes and the uh, uh, changes in the size and the shape of the brain on functional neuroimaging. You can see um, different activation patterns. So we we really know now that the pain in conditions like fibromyalgia that I've been talking about is very real. People aren't making this up, um, but yet people, these tests that we're doing on a research basis can't be ordered clinically. Um, and so a lot of times you, your doctor doesn't necessarily recognize that you have this kind of pain and might treat you as if all of your pain was no susceptible pain with, with drug and non-drug therapies that, uh, again, are not going to work if your pain is coming from your brain or your central nervous system. Next slide. Um, so uh, you can, some of these dr drugs you can use yourself there. You can use over-the-counter pain relievers like acetaminophen. Um, uh, you can use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, the over-the-counter dose. Um, and then if you have osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, or um, the primary treatment is going to be of that condition. Um, and especially if you have an autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis, you're going to be using disease-modifying drugs, biologics, methotrexate, to reduce the inflammatory component of those diseases. And then again, if you're one of the third or so of people that still has a lot of pain and fatigue and sleep problems after you take those drugs, then maybe you have that other kind of pain as well that needs to be treated. Next slide. 
Um, and so uh, acetaminophen um, is a drug um, that's over the counter. Again, you might know this as Tylenol. Um, you should take no more than 4,000 milligrams in 24 hours. Um, if you drink um, much alcohol, you shouldn't take more than 3,000 milligrams a day. And be very careful because acetaminophen hides in a lot of other medicines. Um, any of the brand name medicines that end with set, like, you know, Percocet, any Darvacet, I don't, that's not around anymore, um, mean that it has acetaminophen in it. And one of the ways that people um, accidentally overdose on acetaminophen is they're taking it in different, they're taking Tylenol plus they're taking it, um, it, it in combinations with other drugs. Um, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like uh, naproxen or ibuprofen are available over the counter and can be very helpful. Um, don't take um, two of these drugs. Uh, you should only take either naproxen or ibuprofen or aspirin. Um, these drugs are um, hard on the stomach. In older individuals, there's cardiovascular risk factors of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So again, um, you can take the over-the-counter dose of non-steroidals fairly safely um, unless you have um, like coronary artery disease or a history of peptic ulcer disease. But the prescription doses, again, should be pres prescribed. Next slide. Um, and again, just be aware of the safety issues with over-the-counter medications. Uh, again, just because you have a whole bottle of it doesn't mean it's safe. Uh, people do die of acetaminophen overdoses every year, even though it's an over-the-counter drug. So don't think um, that because it's available over-the-counter that there aren't safety issues. Next slide. And so um, if someone has the kind of pain that I've been talking about today, the the drugs that work are really the entirely different drugs than work if you have pain that's coming from damage in your joints. Um, and so you see down at the bottom, the drugs that work if you have sort of damage uh, or inflammation would be non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, corticosteroids like prednisone, opioids. Um, but when people have fibromyalgia-like pain, none of the, those drugs don't work at all. And we have to use the drugs up at the top, like um, cyclobenzaprine is one of my favorite drugs. You you may know this as flexoral, but a low nighttime dose of cyclobenzaprine can be very helpful. Drugs like duloxetine or Cymbalta, um, as well as gabapentinoids. But these are the drugs that we preferentially use to treat pain that's coming from the brain. Um, and we really stay entirely away from opioids um, when we think that someone has this kind of pain. Next slide. And then uh, this is a start of a segue of how important some of the non-drug therapies are. It doesn't matter if your pain starts as nociceptive or if it starts as a, a brain pain. The longer you have pain, pain causes you to be more stressed. It causes you to become less active. You start to sleep poorly. You gain weight. You develop what psychologists call maladaptive illness behaviors, which are sort of bad habits that you lapse into. The, and all of these things down at the bottom can sort of turn up the volume control on the top. And then, so that's why we see that a lot of people with conditions that start out like osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis as primarily nociceptive, as people have this pain longer and they develop more of these things on the bottom, this becomes more fibromyalgia-like pain. And you have to use non drug therapies pretty aggressively to treat this kind of pain in particular. Next slide. Um, I, I think I said this earlier, a lot of us think that um, the long COVID is the same um, as uh, fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome. And I think there's just more and more evidence and data um, of this. Next slide. Uh, and so um, these are the, the a slide from 2014. Uh, that when I wrote an article on fibromyalgia, these were the non-pharmacologic therapies in 2014 that were effective. Next slide. Oops, I did, we took out a wrong slide. Go back to that slide. Um, but now, in just in the last um, five to 10 years or so, all of the things that are in weak evidence now are up in modest evidence, acupuncture, acupressure, chiropractic manipulation, massage. And so a lot of these non-drug therapies have been increasingly studied over the last uh, five to 10 years and be shown to be effective. And this is why we really think that these non-drug therapies are the preferred therapies for all chronic pain patients. Um, and then again, medications and surgery and injections, obviously, in selected individuals can be very helpful. Next slide. Um, so again, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, it's sort of a long um, word, but 
this really means it's sort of a program that's put together to help chronic pain patients under the umbrella of cognitive behavioral therapy. They'll help you work on getting better sleep and being more active and managing stress. And so it, there's different types of cognitive behavioral therapy, but they can really be incredibly helpful. And just because sometimes cognitive behavioral therapy is given by a psychologist, don't think of it as a psychologically oriented therapy. A lot of what's done in cognitive behavioral therapy, again, is just teaching you different things you can do to make your pain better. Next slide. And so um, I always end my talk with this slide. These, because the evidence base for these non-drug therapies has increased so much, the VA healthcare centers in the United States, the veterans hospitals in the United States now um, reimburse for all of these non-drug therapies, in including things, you know, that we used to be dismissive of, like acupuncture and chiropractic manipulation and yoga and Tai Chi. And so, again, what we're seeing is that the evidence base for these is increasing and increasing and increasing. We hope that more insurance companies will reimburse for a broader range of these. And until that happens, then the Arthritis Foundation, our group has a website called painguide.com that's free, but um, you can get a lot of these non-pharmacologic therapies without actually going to a doctor or a clinic or a health system. Next slide. Um, and even diet and nutrition. I know Dr. Huff's going to talk more about this, but we've done studies recently that um, that diet and nutrition can have a dramatic improvement in pain, especially this kind of fibromyalgia-like pain. And now we're looking at things like intermittent caloric restriction um, to see if that um, at some point might be um, a helpful way to manage chronic pain. Next slide. Okay. Uh, turning it over to Dr. Huff. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Claw. Um, that was actually a great overview, and I've been ch checking into some of the questions that, and I'll try to hit on Q and A as I go through. Um, again, my name is Dr. Tamara Huff. I'm an orthopedic surgeon working in um, rural and urban areas throughout the U.S. And I always like to start by saying I am a doctor. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I am not your doctor, so please, the, the things that I talk about today are generalities. Uh, we will ask, answer some specific questions, but if I haven't examined you, if I haven't laid my hands on you, I can't give you a specific diagnosis. All right, let's move to the next slide. So, um, Dr. Claude did a beautiful job um, leading in or introducing all the things that we're going to be talking about here. And one of the things I saw in the chat as we go through this, we're talking a lot about osteoarthritis, and we also have been mentioning rheumatoid arthritis, but in your friendly orthopedic surgeon's brain, we think of arthritis as osteoarthritis and also these inflammatory arthropathies, which is a mouthful of word that includes your rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, um, psoriatic arthritis, which may not be as obvious on x-ray, but have a lot of the same characteristics when it comes to how we treat them from an orthopedic side of things. So we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through. As far as diet and supplements, while there's no specific diet for pain, a healthy diet is important, watching out for medic for foods that are actually pro-inflammatory. So that's why if you drink a lot of alcohol with it, or if you have a night while you, where you may be eating a lot of your McDonald's or high fat foods and things, those are inflammatory medications that you may actually feel tightness in your joints and pain in your joints. So having an overall balanced diet is very important. Also too, I want to plug one of the Arthritis Foundation's web webinars coming up talking about supplements, herbs, spices, and webinar. Um, I'm gonna just hit on two that I in particular like to talk to my patients about or that I get a lot of questions about. Um, we can talk about more if you have additional ones that you have questions about, especially some of the supplements like glucosamine and chondroitin. I think there was a question about type two collagen. We could talk about those a little bit more as well in the question and answer section. But the specific two that I talk to my patients about a lot, if you could hit the Advance the slide, please. Okay, turmeric. I am a huge proponent and I am a big fan of turmeric. I love to cook with turmeric, but it's actually a great medic, um, a great herb and spice that's very good for inflammation. Um, you might hear people talk about, I think it's golden drinks and things like that you can add to your food. Now, that's not going to necessarily give you a high enough dose to have huge benefits, but the supplement curcumin, which is basically a portion of the turmeric that's actually um, highly concentrated. 
studies show that about 500 milligrams twice a day seems to be a good starter dose for that. That again varies. There's been studies up to all the way up to two grams. Right now, the the verdict is out as far as how much you can take. I recommend staying around 500 milligrams twice a day. Um, on the web, on the actual screen, there is a website you can go to, and this talks about turmeric. But also on this website, it's vetted evidence-based research from the NIH that actually talks about all different types of supplements. As with all medications, please, 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 please let your physician know what you're taking. Some of these medications can interact or these supplements can interact with medications and also can cause blood thinning and some other issues. Turmeric in particular does not. Next slide, please. And we get tons and tons of questions about uh, cannabis, um, CBD oils, um, we, the, again, the literature in the orthopedics right now is going back and forth. It's not as clear as we would like to. Personally, I have no problems with our patients using cannabis oil or the creams and supplements. Um, we are actually seeing some nice work on it with pain control after surgery and actually preventing uh, you needing surgery in the first place. So again, arthritis.org has an excellent webinar that talks more about CBD oil and those options. However, again, strict science-wise, the verdict's out from the orthopedic side of things. Next slide, please. So on this talk, I'm starting for the more general, I call it good health hygiene things, and then we'll move into the more specific orthopedic bone and joint kind of issues that we get to. So with all my patients, I like to talk about the things that are important. So we talk about diet. And, being, and maintaining a healthy weight, but sleep is so important. Sleep is your body and your mind's opportunity to recharge. And most adults, again, need seven to nine hours. Many people don't even realize how much sleep they need because we never get enough. So anytime you're getting under six, it, you're gonna see some cognitive changes as well as your perception of pain. Um, key things leading up to going to bed is you definitely want to limit your screen time. There's a really nice study that showed recently that if you leave the lights on or go to sleep with your television on, it drastically decreases your REM sleep and affects the quality of sleep that you have. So making sure you have a nice, um, cool area to sleep in and making sure you use, um, you have an area that's nice and dark. Um, the Arthritis Foundation in the past has done some nice webinars on uh, sleep and how to sleep better and how it affects pain. Also, to making sure you have gotten a new mattress recently, um, I've done a few talks on that. Mattresses are more important than you realize. And if you have a mattress that's too firm, it actually can cause you to have um, tenderness type pain like bursitis because you aren't having, um, the mattress itself is not conforming as well to your body. Another thing about that is, is maintaining alignment. So we can talk, a, I don't want to dive too far off into that, but if you do have bad, you wake up in the morning, you're feeling like you have back pain and hip pain. Many times if you have a, a mattress that's too soft or it's too hard where you're not maintaining alignment, that can be part of the problem that you're running into. Next slide, please. One big thing that I talk to all my patients about and which is really counterintuitive to a lot of people is the importance of moving. Um, moving is key to helping with pain, especially arthritic pain, whether it be osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, or any of the other arthropathies. Our joints are, are meant to move. So for example, your knee is a joint that has synovial fluid. That's the lubrication of the joint. That's actually what nourishes the cartilage you have well, even if you have one of those x-rays that look like Dr. Claus where it's bone on bone, you still have some cartilage hanging out in there. And gentle movements where you're circulating that fluid helps you continue to keep the cartilage you have left healthy and helps to flush out the inflammatory markers that cause the pain. So when we talk about movement, I always like to talk slow, well, excuse me, start slowly when it comes to movement. You're not going out there and doing CrossFit. You're not running a marathon. Something as simple as walking is important. And that's why I put movement on here versus exercise. Exercise, people are thinking about squatting and doing a lot of things that aren't really joint friendly initially, but cycling is excellent. Walking is excellent. Swimming or even walking in a pool. Those are gent gentle 
joint friendly ways of getting moving. Even line dancing or um, anything that makes it, that makes you want to move is important. Again, we don't want to overdo it. That's the thing to keep in mind. A lot of times we go to zero to 100. And I cannot tell you how many people come to me after the first of the year when boot camp season starts, when CrossFit season starts, and they're hurting and they've overdone it. You really have to be careful if you've been sedentary for a while and you're ramping up. Also, movement is important because that can help you strengthen the muscles around your knees um, and also help you control your weight. Just to kind of keep this in mind, for every 10 pounds, you gain, your knees are seeing about 40 times your body weight or seeing an additional 40 pounds. So that's the equivalent of carrying around 40 pound kettlebells. If you're going up and down stairs, that can go up to six times your body weight or even eight times your body weight. So that's why weight and exercise, all those things are so closely related to the pain that you're having in your joints. Next slide, please. Now, ratcheting up. So after I've talked you initially and you come to see me you're having pain and we've talked about diet exercise and just general moving the next step up I definitely like to talk to people about is physical therapy or occupational therapy I love using that even before we even talk about surgery because it can help you start moving especially if you've been sedentary for a while or you're getting over a severe injury um, it's just a great way to get moving I also like the fact that they can give us a home exercise program so if even if you don't have the financial means to do a full course of physical therapy, they can set you up with exercises to help you move forward. Another plug I would love to give to people is a website called orthoinfo.org. That's ortho, O-R-T-H-O dot, excuse me, O-R-T-H-O info dot O-R-G. That is actually from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery and it's geared towards patients. And it has exercises for your back knees, for your hip. All of these things are free and they also have pictures to show you how to do them. Again, if you've been injured recently, I do recommend you talk to your doctor before you do it, but these are great ways to get moving in a safe fashion. Our friends with, ortho, with physical therapy, occupational therapy can also do things such as dry needling, ultrasound, TENS units, all those things that Dr. Claw was mentioning. They're, they're there to do those things and help guide you through the process. Also, they can do therapeutic which is amazing, especially for neck and back pain. Let's see. All right, next slide. Before I actually, can you go back to the prior slide? Okay. One thing I do want to mention before I jump out, I did not specifically mention chiropractors. Um, there's nothing wrong with chiropractors. There's a lot of debate in orthopedics on the pros and cons of using them. I think they're a great partner to work together with. One thing I say is just make sure if you're having persistent pain or if you had a recent injury that you are at least getting an x-ray at some point. There are times where manipulation can cause damage if you have some underlying issues that your chiropractor might not know about. Same thing with physical therapy. Sometimes there are um, physical therapy services and things you can get without a referral, which is just fine. But if you're having persistent pain, especially bruising, had a recent injury, you want to seek care so at least you can get a screening to make sure nothing else is going on. Okay, now you can go to the next slide. All right, so medications. And just like Dr. Claus said, we really don't use opioids much at all in orthopedics now. We're transitioning um, very much away from those unless it's acute pain, meaning you just broke your leg, you just broke your hip, you just had surgery. Um, these, uh, one of the questions we had were about um, over-the-counter options, um, non-prescription strength medicine that you can use to help with um, joint pain or arthritic pain. And I just want to kind of go through some of these. So starting at the top, just like Dr. Claus said, I am a huge fan of anti-inflammatories. And that's one of the first things that we start off with. Again, you can start off with the over-the-counter ones, ibuprofen and naproxen. Um, uh, and you can then go into some of the more uh, prescription strength ones like meloxicam. Key thing, just like you said, is there are consequences, especially related to GI distress. So if you've had a gastric bypass surgery, if you have a history of bleeding ulcers, if you had diverticulitis, you really want to be careful about um, using those medications. Also too, it can affect your blood pressure and it can affect your um, kidneys. So if you have kidney disease, 
stay away from them. If you have heart disease, you want to be very mindful about those things. Um, Tylenol or acetaminophen. Many people do not realize the benefits. We use it around perioperative care, meaning um, preparing you before surgery, use um, Tylenol to help uh, improve pain control. And it actually helps opioids work better in the um, perioperative set setting, which means the setting before and after your surgery. So Tylenol is an excellent option that we use both in the hospital, but also you can use at home and you can alternate with um, with anti-inflammatories. Just like Dr. Qua said, we do have to be mindful. We do not want to lead into liver disease. I typically tell my patients to stay under 3000 milligrams. So your extra strength Tylenol is typically around 500 milligrams. Um, Moving on to like topical options of, I'm a big fan of salon post patches. They're um, a lidocaine or a lidocaine type um, patch that you can put on wherever you're hurting it. Those are terrific for areas like low back pain, shoulder pain, anywhere where I tell folks when you don't need it, it's a great place to put it. And it can help again with um, aching pain that you have along with Voltaren gel, which is a topical type of anti-inflammatory, which can be beneficial for those who can't take oral anti-inflammatories because of um, GI distress or other issues. If you come to your friendly orthopedic surgeon, there are a myriad of different types of injections that we could potentially give you. One of the most common we do is a steroid injection. There are many different types of steroids, um, uh, many, many, many different types that we use. There's also what referred to as gel injections. These are also known as visco supplementation. Um, the idea behind these gels is to inject your knee with the building blocks of cartilage to help nourish the cartilage you have left. Um, there has been some debate recently as, as to what how beneficial these are. And I think they're still beneficial for the right patients, but many insurance companies do not cover these now um, because of the debate in the literature about the benefits of them. PRP or... Um, Completely related protein. This is when you take your own blood and we spin out the goodness, the, um, the, the platelet properties out of it and then inject it back into an area. Again, there are some benefits depending on where you're doing that, whether it's your knee or it's into uh, tendinous areas. It varies very specifically regarding what part of the body you're working on and why you're doing it. It is not a be all end all. The same thing about stem cells. They are not be all end all. So if you have end stage osteoarthritis, it's bone on bone, PRP stem cells, those aren't going to get it. So it's some a discussion you really definitely need to talk to about your position before you go down that route. Also, too, those two particular things, the PRP and the stem cells, still are not covered by most insurance. And so I like to let people know those can be quite expensive um, if you decide to go into that, go down that particular route. Um, next slide, please. And surgery. Um, as an orthopedic surgeon, really, I think a lot of people think that our first stop is surgery, and it actually isn't. We want to make sure we're doing it for the right reasons. A lot of the outcomes data that Dr. Claw was talking about is when we, even though we're, when what happens when we don't adequately diagnose the cause of your pain. So we want to make sure we're doing it for the right reasons and that we actually can um, give you the best results. So that's one of the reasons why very rarely will we ever offer you arthritis, um, excuse me, um, joint replacement surgery or any type of surgery on your first visit, because we want to make sure that you fail those other conservative man management um, steps, because that conservative management helps us differentiate, is this fibromyalgia? Is this pain coming from your back and mimicking hip pain? Is your knee pain really coming from your hip? We want to go through and make sure we're the right surgery for the right reason. Now, when you do do the correct surgery for the right correct reason, hip and knee replacements are two of the best surgeries that we do, but the best quality of life improvement of any other surgery that we do. And the idea behind it is we resurface or put metal caps on the ends of the bone and actually get rid of the physical arthritis that's there. Again, the key reason, key thing is, is not treating the x-ray and making sure we're doing it for the right reason. Um, one key thing is in inflammatory arthritis, arthropathies, such as rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis, many times on x-ray, it doesn't look that bad. It may not seem like your arthritis is that bad because 
is actually inflammation of the joint lining, which is called the synovium. That's the reason why when you get in there, we actually see a lot of times more damage. So if, if you take someone with rheumatoid arthritis, their x-rays might not look that bad when they get in there. It's just as bad as if not worse than some that, someone that had traditional osteoarthritis or wear and tear arthritis. Um, the same thing when you're trying to make the decision about spine surgery, it's making sure you're doing the right surgery for the right reason and that we're treating the right type of pain because there are a lot of factors. It's not cut and dry. You can have severe osteoarthritis and also have fibromyalgia. So you just want to make sure that you're doing the right surgery for the right reason with the right expectations of your outcome. And next slide. All right, that was it. Um, I'm opening up for definitely for lots of looking forward to lots of questions. If you have want to reach out to me, please feel free to visit um, my website to follow me on social, especially on ladybones.com. We talk about a lot of these kind of issues and how to talk to your doctor about the questions that you have and making sure you're getting your concerns answered and addressed. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you both Dr. Huff and Dr. Claw for all of your informative information. But before we wrap up, we are gonna take some questions. As a reminder, you can continue to keep putting questions inside of the chat box and you'll have the Q&A function that's down at the bottom. So uh, if you haven't already, if you have any additional questions, please put them in. Please note that we've already received several questions with your registration before the webinar. We'll do the best that we can to answer as many questions as we can. But if you don't get your question answered, please know that we'll share several opportunities and events to do so towards the end of the session. We also receive many questions about supplements and diet. As previously mentioned, there will be an upcoming webinar on those and that'll be on November 7th and that'll address all things regarding supplements, spices and herbs for arthritis. So let's get started with the questions. The first question is for Dr. Claw. Are there any other over-the-counter medications that I can take for inflammation or pain as I am unable to tolerate NSAIDs or Tylenol? Um. Well, D Dr. Huff mentioned uh, CBD or cannabidiol, and I think it's a really good option for, um, especially for elderly people that were concerned about some of the side effects of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, I just want to be clear to people that there's sort of two major cannabinoids in cannabis. One is CBD or cannabidiol that is non psychoactive, non addictive, non anything, and it's actually legal in all 50 states if that if that CBD was derived from hemp. Um, the, the other major constituent of cannabis that everyone knows about is THC. That's the thing that gets you high. Um, but C uh, CBD alone looks like it might be helpful for certain types of pain and it's far safer than anything that contains THC. Um, and again, THC isn't legal federally. It's legal in 25 or so states, but it's not legal federally. So if you want to go the cannabinoid route, try CBD alone first, um, usually orally, but the creams can help if the, if it's very close to the surface, like the knee. Um, and if that doesn't work, then you might think about adding a little bit of THC, but the all the evidence with THC is a little bit is better than a lot. We see a lot of people in states like Michigan that have passed, you know, medical marijuana laws or legalized cannabis, that the, the patients who are trying to get benefit from cannabis are taking way too much and they're just getting high and stoned. They're not getting pain relief. So just be careful about um, the THC component of cannabinoids. Thank you. The second question is also for you, Dr. Huff. Why would an ortho surgeon do a total knee replacement on someone who has had no damage to their knee, but lots of pain? Again, I just want to preface this answer by I am not your orthopedic surgeon um, and I have not seen the x-rays or MRI findings that may have caused them to do that particular surgery. But just like we were talking about, there are different types of arthritis and in many cases, inflammatory arthropathies don't show as much damage on x-ray as um, traditional bone-on-bone -bone osteoarthritis. So that's one of the reasons why many times we will try to do the conservative things. So sometimes we'll do 
a lidocaine injection into the knee to see to confirm that the knee is actually the source of your pain and it's your joint and not pain radiating down from your back or something to that effect. So if after all of those things have confirmed, if you've had knee scopes, you've seen the arthritis and the chondral damage inside your knee that may not be present on x-ray, then most surgeons will, will consider offering you a total knee replacement at that point. Thank you. The next question either of you can take. So safety regarding taking an NSAID and topical NSAIDs together, safety taking NSAIDs with methotrexate. Uh, NSAIDs with methotrexate is fine. Most people that are taking methotrexate are taking NSAIDs. Um, it's probably okay to take, the, the, you don't get very much systemic absorption of any of the topical NSAIDs. Um, so it might be okay, but I wouldn't I wouldn't take the prescription strength of a NSAID plus a topical. The probably the over the counter strength of an NSAID plus a topical would probably be okay. You're not probably not getting in any trouble. You agree? Yeah, and I, yeah, I agree. I actually tell my patients if you eating the topical, then you really should be taking the pill or um, the pill. So you can do like a Tylenol with your Voltaren gel, but I ask people not to do. This. Uh, the prescription along like Mobic or something like that along with um, right. um, a topical. Okay. Dr. Huff, why did I get nerve pain after my knee revision replacement? Again, I just want to again remind people that there are many different factors involved. So as an orthopedic surgeon, I'm not your orthopedic surgeon, so I can't tell you for sure. One thing that can, um, anytime you're having surgical intervention and any, especially in knee replacements, we're going through the front of your knee where there actually are um, nerves crossing over the front. So you can definitely have some pain or numbness after the surgery, just from the actual surgery itself, going through the skin, going for, through the superficial nerves. But again, that's a hard question to answer about seeing your actual images, knowing your op report and knowing your particular case. Thank you. And I noticed that we're receiving lots of questions regarding supplements. I would like to just remind everyone that we have the supplement guide on arthritis found on the Arthritis Foundation. And it's a supplement uh, web webinar that's coming up again, November 7th at 8 p.m. So for all of you who have a lot of questions regarding supplements, please refer to the website and or the webinar. And the next question would be, what are your recommendations for splints or braces for knee or wrist pain? Dr. Huff, would you like to go first? Oh, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> it all depends on what your pain is based on. So if you're having um, knee pain, let's start there. Sometimes I will tell people to just do a simple over-the-counter knee brace our friendly Walmart. I do not get paid by Walmart, but I said a lot of folks over there just get an over-the-counter knee brace with a cutout in the center for your kneecap. A lot of times that's a nice thing to just start off with. Anything more aggressive than that, prescription um, braces and things like that, you really need to talk to your rheumatologist or to your orthopedic surgeon before you need get any of those larger braces. And as far as wrist brace, it just, again, depends on what you're doing it for. So a lot of times I, if you're just having some soreness, it's fine to get an over-the-counter brace, but it depends. Is this tunnel is this from arthritis it kind of makes a difference on why you're getting it getting what the what's causing the pain as to the type of brace you would necessarily need thank you dr claw is fibromyalgia with inflammation and body common i see a pain management doctor and recently seen a roomie to determine if anything autoimmune if i get a small rash on leg or arm it tends to take a long time to heal so we don't think of fibromyalgia as being um, a classic inflammatory condition like rheumatoid arthritis or an autoimmune disease, but there is low-grade inflammation that occurs as part of fibromyalgia. It, it seems like that inflammation is actually what we call neurogenic inflammation, or it's being driven by the nervous system. It's not the same kind of inflammation that people with rheumatoid arthritis have. So people will feel, and, and again, we can see there, there's some inflammation, but it's it's not, we don't use anti-inflammatory drugs to treat it. We think it's really that inflammation is really being driven by the nervous system. And we really try to treat that rather than uh, treat, you know, like use aggressive anti-inflammatory drugs. 
Thank you. And also, Dr. Flies, your research on expected treatment options on anti-NGF treatment for humans for osteoarthritis, it's available for dogs and is going well for them. <laughs> That's really, that that set of compounds is really sad because we thought that, that those compounds were going to really be incredibly effective for treating osteoarthritis. It turns out that they had a really big safety problem and that about two out of 100 people that got those compounds actually had rapidly progressive osteoarthritis of a different joint, not the joint that was treated, a different joint. And so that was too high of a of a risk, the FDA thought, for to, do, to broadly approve these. So I guess that they think that's okay if that happens to a dog, but not to a human. I didn't know they were approved in dogs, but um, uh, but, but again, that that's the, the problem with those drugs was they were in development a long time. We thought they were going to be like super, you know, game changers. And it was that that toxicity, that rapidly accelerating osteoarthritis of a non of a joint that was normal before that that really put the kibosh on all of those compounds. There were three different compounds and GF antibodies, and I, I don't I think that they're all totally shut down now. Thank you. Can you treat OA inflammation with RA meds? Someone asked about hydroxychloroquine. Dr. Cloud, can you please address that? It's not common practice to do that. Um, it, it actually wouldn't be a terrible idea. We use hydroxychloroquine as like our um, our lowest level anti-inflammatory drug in rheumatology. Like like almost all lupus patients will be on it in the background. A lot of RA patients will be on it in the background because it's fairly safe, but it's not a very potent um, anti-inflammatory drug. So, And there is a mild inflammatory component to osteoarthritis, so maybe that um, person has something. I never thought of using hydroxychloroquine in that setting, but it, it's not a terrible idea. Okay. Next question. For the non-drug therapies, is there any possibility of using some or many of those in order to eliminate pain and put the person into remission. My concern is that just because the pain is gone doesn't mean the condition isn't still damaging in the behind the scenes. Either doctor can answer, uh, specifically acupuncture is what they're asking in reference to. Well, oh, we do a lot of work. Um, Sorry, yeah. Oh, Sorry. no, you go ahead, Dr. Clark. Go ahead. Yeah, we do a lot of research with acupuncture and acupressure. That's a, a, a cool thing that people can self-administer or have someone else do to them. And the studies are, in fact, someone I think in the chat was complaining about, and it's true that CMS or Medicare doesn't cover a lot of these things, but acupuncture was the first of these sort of, you know, Eastern therapies that CMS began to cover for low back pain. And so they're starting to add coverage for things like acupuncture, but it's slow. It, we, it should be more than it is right now. Dr. Huck, did you have anything to add to that? No, I just actually want to agree with the acupuncture. Definitely, definitely uh, seeing some benefit for those things. And for us, what we talk about is what a lot of times with um, the non-drug medications or even with the drug medications, you may not be able to necessarily reverse your x-rays, but that doesn't mean you can't improve your pain. So just like you're not treating x-rays, um, you should not be having surgery just for x-rays and not for pain. Um, you can improve your pain without necessarily changing your x-rays. Thank you. And the next question is for you, Dr. Huff. Do you have any comment on the use of devices that incorporate heat, massage, and red light therapy for knee pain, either prior to knee replacement or distantly post-op knee replacement with continuing pain? So I don't have much familiarity with the red light therapy. Specifically with heat and ice and massage, we are big fans of that from an orthopedic side of things. Typically, we whether it's knees or even back, shoulder, things like that, ideally you want to use your heat when you're warming up. So for instance, getting going at night, that's why it feels so nice after a nice warm shower, your joints feel better and you're feeling a lot easier to move. So anything that incorporates that is terrific. But also on the flip side, ice is a great option. So that's why you see your athletes doing the ice baths at the after um, sporting events, after training, that ice helps a lot with inflammation and can additionally help with Hey, definitely ice, heat are great to use as well as massage. Thank you. 
Dr. Claw, is it possible to grow out of a medication or get used to it? What do you do when something that's been helping for years stops? An example, Cymbalta. Unfortunately, that does happen. Certain drugs are are more likely to, you, you develop what's called tolerance to them. So opioids would be a class of drugs that they were, that's classic, that you need to keep going up on the dose to get the same effect. Others, it doesn't happen as often, but um, it's very frustrating. I, I certainly have a lot of patients that have, you know, drugs like uh, Cymbalta, because that was mentioned, but any drug really that it just, for reasons that aren't clear, you know, stops working after a while and you have to try a different approach. Thank you. What about spinal blocks for pain? Anyone? They they don't so, work as okay. well as they're purported to work. Uh, we do a lot of work in this area and I'm in a department of anesthesiology. Um, there's a lot of epidural st steroid injections and RF ablations and things like that done in the United States way more than any other country. And it's not clear how beneficial a lot of these procedures are. So I think, again, it's just a cautionary note. Nothing wrong if you have back pain or whatever to get one of those procedures and give it a try and see if it helps. But if you go into a doctor's office and on the first thing they say, you're going to need six uh, epidural steroid injections like uh, a month apart, you need to run out of there as fast as possible because that's a, they're just, that's a ka-chink, ka-chink. They're just wanting to make money um, by putting on their needle jockeys. Um, trying to make money off of you rather than that that's really going to be a benefit to you. So um, you just be be cautious about any kind of injection. Um, or for that matter, I, I, I agree with Dr. Huff, is that surgery, like knee and hip replacement surgery is about the most effective surgery for pain. But if you talk about like surgery for low back pain, uh, yeah, 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 you know, uh, so be careful about going getting surgery for chronic pain there's very few chronic pain conditions that that actually is an effective treatment for and again in the u.s we overuse surgical procedures and things like that because they're they're well reimbursed and so people there are different physicians who will do a lot of them even if that isn't necessarily a tremendous benefit to their patients and just one additional thing I would mention too. So many times with injections, we're again using them not just for therapeutic, but diagnostic purposes. So there are times like that we're trying to determine, especially with spine injections, spinal injections, what is actually, what level is actually causing your problem? Is this truly what's called discogenic pain versus a radicular pain, which means running down your leg? There are certain types of pain that do much better with surgery versus ones that you should not have surgery for. So that's another reason why you may potentially have be offered injections, not just to treat you like a human pin cushion. We're just going to make sure that we're doing the right procedure for the right reason. Thank you. And lastly, I would like to address massage therapy and cryotherapy for pain and inflammation. And actually, we'll take one more after that. They, they both can be helpful. I did, most people probably don't know what cryotherapy is, but they probably know massage therapy, but it's just cold. So, yeah. Yeah, but, but it's yeah, just, but it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it can definitely be helpful. Just like we were talking about earlier, like cryotherapy can definitely be helpful. We even use the little cuffs after your joint replacement. We'll put a little cuff on you to help with the pain. Thank you. And lastly, I would just like to know one takeaway and one piece of advice that you'd like to to give to anyone from tonight's session? Try two new non-drug therapies that you've never tried before in the next year. That that slide that I showed of the things that are available at the VA, including acupuncture, just take two of those that you've never tried and that you think might help you. And, and you might be pleasantly surprised that you incorporate the rest of your life and that, that non-drug therapy becomes something you do the rest of your life. I Thank love you. that. <laughs> I absolutely love that. Um, I definitely echo what Dr. Claw said. And then the only other thing I would say is just don't be afraid to ask questions. So if you're moving through the process and you're like, eh, is this really the next step we, you, you need to take? I, do I really need injection? Do I really need to have surgery? Don't be afraid to take a step back 
ask a question, get a second opinion before you move forward on something that's a little bit more aggressive than the things that we've talked about tonight. Thank but you. But you're not so going to get much. better un unless you keep moving forward. That's really the most yeah. important advice for our patients is keep trying new things, keep moving forward. There's hope. There's uh, new treatments. There's new approaches. Don't don't give up yeah. because it, then you then for sure you won't get better. Thank you so much. And then I'll add just one last piece of advice as well. As mentioned periodically throughout the call numerous times, uh, the two experts that we have tonight are definitely experts. They are definitely doctors, but again, they are not your personal doctors. So again, the asking questions is important and also realizing that one outcome may not be your outcome. So as it relates to these different conditions, you may have the same signs, the same symptoms, but your body may definitely react different to different treatments at different times. So just make sure, again, that you are asking lots of questions to your healthcare professionals and, you know, just ensuring that you do even some research on your own into some of the things that they talk about. I know that's something that's kind of helped me along my journey was working with my roomie to also research some of the information before meds were changed or before different therapies were started having that time to kind of have a heads up, hey, next appointment, if this doesn't work, we may try this or we may try that. How about you take a look at it before you come in, you know, to have my input as well. So definitely, I would say uh, all of the advice that was given tonight was amazing. And definitely just be sure to ask questions about your individual situations. Thank you again to Dr. Huff and Dr. Claw for all of your time and expertise tonight. I definitely look forward myself to using some of the valuable insights that you gave tonight to keeping myself healthy. Er, I try my best, but you know, we all have those days where we're getting that uh not necessarily McDonald's, maybe Burger King for me or Wendy's, but uh we all have our days. <laughs> So definitely looking forward to using a lot of the information from tonight's webinar in the future to just further myself and keep myself healthy. So before we sign off for the night, it's just a reminder that we have several resources and events to help you manage your arthritis. So we've got the connect groups, which are a great way to get support and learn more about the positive coping strategies that we have. When we're managing arthritis, the groups meet in person and some of them actually meet online. You can always go to our website, connectgroups.arthritis.org. Um, if you are, in fact, a member of the African-American community, uh, I have a group that I co-facilitate as well. So that is also a bi-monthly group. And then we also have webinars. Like mentioned before, we offer free webinars every month and it's hosted by nationally recognized leaders in arthritis care. Registration for the webinars below are opening very soon. So we've got the Let's Talk Pain, Navigating Arthritis Together, which is October 18th from 8 to 9 Eastern Time. Arthritis in the Workplace, Rights and Organomics, which is October 25th from 6 to 7.15 Eastern Time, which will also be a good one as October is National Disability Awareness Month. So please, please, if you're not able, also encourage your employers to be a part of that one as well. Supplements, Herbs, and Spices for Arthritis is November 7th from 8 to 9.15 p.m. Eastern Time. Military and the Arthritis, the Mental Health Pain Connection is November 9th from 7 to 8.15. And there is also a military and veterans group, connect group as well that, that goes. So please, please, please make sure you go to our site and make sure you check out the groups and check into all that apply. Please make sure that if you cannot actually attend and you register, you can always go back to the site and you can actually take a look at the past webinars as well. So there's links that we have that we provide for that as well. We have Jingle Bell Run, which is arthritis.org slash JBR. We have a Live Yes podcast, which is at arthritis.org slash podcast. And that way you'll be able to get more tips and real talk about arthritis from experts and patients who understand. We also have a helpline, which is 1-800-283-7800 or arthritis.org slash helpline. And there, and there they have trained staff that'll help you navigate through challenges, treatment questions, insurance questions, and more. And then lastly, there's the survey. So in a few days, you'll receive a survey asking about your experience. Please make sure that you take the time to fill it out completely and honestly. 
So well, that way we can better serve you in the future. If you give honest answers, then that way, you know, we know exactly what resources, what things to target in the future, because again, it's definitely all about you. And I would like to lastly thank all of our sponsors. And those are Abby, Jansen, Kenview, and Bristol Myers Squibb for providing the support to make this event possible tonight. And thank you so much again for joining us tonight. Have a good night.